I said the Lord is always good to uh, be with faithful brethren, brethren that love the Lord, striving to do that which is right. I was preparing to come here on uh, yesterday and I said, I'm going to wear jeans and a shirt. And I don't get to do that at home. And so uh, I was looking forward to that. And so when I saw my brethren in here, they got on jeans. I'm like, and Brother Joe had on jeans this morning. I said, man, I'm right at home. Right at home. And so uh, a little reprieve from the city and come to where some, some folk that are real at. Well, I better not say that. But don't record that part. I want us to take the thought of the song that we just sung because truth be told, when we consider our responsibility to be that light, to be able to uh, shine that gleam across the waves, possibly those who are struggling in their Christianity can see the conduct of righteousness in our lives make a turn. And friends, make no mistake about it, God desires all men to be saved and come to the knowledge of the truth. And so we never, never gloat about someone losing their way. But they ought to be able to see the light of Jesus Christ in our lives as we're striving to do that which is right in every community that we're in, whether it is in the country or in the city, we have a responsibility to do our part to help people see the light of the glorious gospel in our lives. And so what I want us to do, I want us to do a study in the book of Psalm. Psalm 112. Psalm 112, as I was pondering this week, I was thinking about what can I uh, preach and teach to brethren that I'm not in front of all of the time. If I was at home, I would be under the uh, title of obedience because we're talking about obedience all month. However, I was thinking about Psalm 112 and don't know who the psalmist is. It really doesn't matter. We know he's inspired by God. Uh, don't know if it's David or Moses or his son Solomon or the sons of Korah. We don't know. However, we do know this, that this particular individual is inspired. And the things in which he has written benefits us. And so we're going to be looking at all ten of these passages. And I figure we'll take about two or three minutes per passage. And I'll have you out by one o'clock. That ought to be, that's about two minutes of passage. And so I want us to be considering some things as it relates to uh, the condition of the righteous. The condition of the righteous. And that condition is walking in the light. And so, number one, we understand that God is to be adored. Praise the Lord. And you think about that word praise, it's hallelujah. God is to be praised. When we think about children of God, those of us who are truly in tune with God, we want to be a people who are praising God, adoring God, drawing God close to us. And so here the psalmist says, praise the Lord. And then notice what he says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord. We understand the, the idea of being blessed, happy. The idea there is one who is prosperous in his spirituality. He understands that God is the one that blesses him. But blessed is the man who fears the Lord. What does we mean by fear? I'm talking about being reverent to God. In Psalm 36 and verse number 1, why do men sin? Men sin because there is no fear of God before their eyes. That's why men sin. That's why men go against the will of God, because they don't fear God. They don't reverence God. When God is reverenced, then that individual, he is one or she is one that fears the Lord. But why should we fear the Lord? We fear the Lord because the eyes of the Lord are over the righteous. Turn to Psalm 33 and look at verse number 18. And we're going to be all in the Psalms this morning. The Psalms is a very comforting book. A book that ought to give us great encouragement. In Psalm 33, in verse number 18, notice what the Bible there says. Behold, the eye of the Lord is on those who fear him, on those who hope in his mercy. Question, do you fear the Lord? I know you do because you're here. You want to fear the Lord. In Psalm 119, in verse number 38, we must be devoted to fearing God. 
We must be devoted to fearing God. Here, God, his eyes are over those who fear him, and those who fear him are devoted to him. We honor him. God is our all in all as the people of God. These are the blessed ones, if you will. But what is the fear of the Lord? In Proverbs 1 and verse number 7, notice what the Bible says there, and then we'll go to Proverbs chapter 3. In Proverbs 1 and verse number 7, the fear of the Lord is the beginning of knowledge. That's what the fear of the Lord is. One passage would say the fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. And we understand that wisdom comes from above, the wisdom that truly counts, James 3, 13 through 18. But notice Proverbs 3, 13 through verse 18. Here we see the benefits of the wisdom because we fear God. Notice, happy is the man who finds wisdom. Kind of reminds me of Proverbs 4 and verse number 7. Wisdom is the principal thing, therefore get wisdom. And in all thy getting, get an understanding. There are so many people who are walking according to their own wisdom, their own understanding, yet God is saying, I want you to come to me for wisdom, James 1 and verse 5. And so he says in verse 13, happy is the man who finds wisdom, which means that this person is looking for wisdom. And the man who gains understanding, he draws out uh, discretion. For her proceeds are better than the profits of silver, and her gain than fine gold. She is more precious than rubies, and all the things you may desire cannot compare to her. Friends, did you hear that, brothers and sisters in Christ? Here we understand that the wisdom of God does not compare to anything that we can put our eyes on or hands on. Question. How often are we going to God for wisdom? Or do we rely upon what we think is right? No, that'll get us in trouble in our marriages. That'll get us in trouble with the brethren. That'll get us in trouble even with the government. It'll get us in trouble with our common man, our fellow man. If we walk according to our own wisdom, every single time we walk according to the wisdom of God, we're right with God, whether or not man likes it or not. But when we walk according to our own wisdom, friends, we'll find ourselves not having the best results possible. And so here it is more desirable and it cannot be compared with anything. Length of days is in her hands. In her left hand, riches and honor. Her ways are ways of pleasantness. And all her paths are peace. She is a tree of life to those who take hold of her. And happy are all who retain her. Question, what are we retaining? God desires for us to be a people of wisdom who fear him, who delight in his commandments. Go back to Psalm 112. In Psalm 112, in verse number one, the latter part, who delights greatly in his commandments. Jesus would say, if you love me, keep my commandments. And friends, they're still commandments. I know we live in a time today where people are saying, well, uh, members of the Church of Christ, they are commandment keepers. They're, they're legalistic. Well, uh, think about that, friends. If one is a legalist, the opposite is to be illegal. I think I would rather be legal than illegal. I think I would rather be doing the will of God, keeping the commandments of God, than not keeping the commandments of God. And so when we keep the commandments of God, we are in his good graces and we love him. And those who love God, John 15, 14, are his friends. Don't you want to be a friend of God? Aren't you a friend of God? And so when we keep the commandments of God, we're his friends because we love him and he loves us. Notice verse 2. His descendants will be mighty on earth. Whose descendants? The man who keeps the commandments of God, the man who delights in the commandments of God, the man or the woman that fears the Lord, the one who is blessed, the one who praises God. You saw how we just worked that backwards? That's the one whose descendants, notice friends, will be mighty on earth. Unfortunately, we have so many that believe that uh, might is right. Well, wisdom. That's what's mighty. If you truly want to be a blessed people, you, you got to be people who are operating according to the wisdom of God. I'm reminded of Proverbs, I'm sorry, Ecclesiastes chapter 9, don't want to go there, but verses 13 and following, it talks about an older man who was wise and he, he uh, was able to deliver his city because of his great wisdom. 
Unfortunately, in America, and we all love America, but if we're not careful, we would think might is right. But truth be told, in Christ, wisdom is, is might. You can outthink somebody. That's one thing about God. God is so witty. He just outthinks his opponent. And if we stay with God's word, guess what we will do? We will outthink our opponent. Well, who's our opponent? The devil. But we have to stay with the wisdom of God. Here, the descendants of the one who keeps the commandments of God, they will be mighty on the earth. They'll be the salt of the earth, the light of the world, a city that is set upon a hill that cannot be hid. It doesn't matter where we are. We ought to be this type of example to the world that is around us. Notice what he says. The generation of the upright will be blessed. Uh, there's a few things that I was considering when I was looking at this text. He says, the generation of the upright will be blessed. How? Verse 3, wealth and riches, righteousness. Verse 4, the upright, unto the upright, there arises light in the darkness. Notice the three things that couple that. He is gracious, full of compassion, and righteous. Let's stop for a second. As I was looking at this, I was talking to Brother Joe this morning, and I was talking about uh, the Hebrew and the Aramaic and the Greek, and we were talking about the original language. And one thing I love to do is love to go to the original language and see how God says this. One thing I learned about these uh, particular words, especially in verse number four, he is gracious, full of mercy, or compassion, and righteous. Only one time we find this particular word being used as it relates to mankind, gracious and full of compassion. The other times, they're all directed to God himself. So that caused me to think, hmm, we're following God. We're an upright people. Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29, God made man upright, but man has sought many inventions. And so God, who is upright himself, he's a moral being. He is one that is full of compassion. And so that caused me to think. Only one time in the Hebrew we find the word gracious and full of compassion directed toward man. That's all God has to say is one time. I remember as a kid, my mom used to say, boy, if I got to tell you something two times, I'm going to get you. Mm-hmm. Oh, them days are over now. Now we give kids three and four, five, six chances. No, I'm going to tell you this one time, boy, and that's all I'm going to tell you. Yes, ma'am. Twelve times we find the word gracious pointing toward God. Twelve times we find the phrase full of compassion directed toward God. One time, only in this passage, is directed toward the one who is upright, the man, the blessed man, the one that keeps his commandment. And so it caused me to think, what is graciousness? Meaning that he's ready to pardon Friends, do we need some of that today? I believe we do. It's so easy to condemn people. If anything, we're looking for opportunities like God is to let people off. And so it reminded me of 1 Corinthians 13, 1 through 8, the love chapter. If we're looking for reasons to condemn people, we're going to find them. But if we're looking for opportunities to be merciful, full of compassion, looking for opportunities to pardon, just like God did by sending his son, friends, I believe our mindset would even be better. And so here we find God, and he's telling us through the psalmist, unto the upright there arises light in the darkness. It's interesting that God sees in the darkness, that in the midst of all of the darkness, you ought to be able to see a speck of light. We're that light. We're that one that is shining a light above the waves, that the one who is out there on the sea and he's lost in the sea because it's dark, he can come to the lighthouse. Oh, Jesus, when he came in John 1, verse number 3, light came into the world, but the world received him not. Jesus is the light of the world, John 8, verse 12. Here, we're the light of the world, Matthew 5, 16. The meaning our mentality, our eyesight, the things that we represent are of God. And friends, we can't allow the darkness that is in this world to saturate our minds to the point that we're not light ourselves. Here, 
we see that his gracious, he is, he is gracious and full of compassion and righteous, looking for opportunities to pardon, showing sympathy, merciful, pity. When people are in sin, it shouldn't cause us to say they deserve that. When people are in sin, it should cause us to be thinking, what can I do to help them out of sin? My prayer has been, Lord Jesus, come quickly. No, that has not been my prayer lately. My prayer has been, Father, give us more time to help sinners come to repentance. Amen. People are lost in their sins. And so we ought to be looking for opportunities. We ought to be praying that God give us more time on this time side to help people see that they need to come to the Lord and they need to be saved. Because if not, Jesus said, if you die in your sins, where I am, you can't come. Here we see that the condition of the righteous is a condition of graciousness, a condition of compassion, but a condition of righteousness. And so when we think of righteousness in this text, he is just in punishing, but also just in rewarding. Question, do you practice that? Are we practicing that? When we're ready to punish, do we give the full measure of punishment? When we're desiring to be rewarding, do we try to reward as much as possible? Here we see the condition of the righteous one is one who has his mind set upon holiness and righteousness. He's a blessed man. He's one that keeps the commandments of God. Even his seed is mighty in the earth because he has taught his seed, but also he's gracious full of compassion and righteous. The closer I get to 50, the more I realize how much grace and mercy I need from God. Amen? But we ought to be distributing that. And so this world is so sick, it's so dark, it's so cynical, and if we're not careful, Romans 12, 1 and 2, we'll find ourselves being the same. Reminded what Paul told the church at Rome there, I beseech you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. Watch this. And be not conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good, acceptable, and perfect will of Almighty God. Friends, We've got to take a step back and we've got to listen. Take a step back and be humble. And as I was singing that last song, I appreciate that last song. Let the Lord lights be burning. I, and the light is not way at the top and shining so far above the waves that the person who is out at sea cannot see. The light is at the top and it's shining over the water so the one who is lost can see. And that requires humility. And every day I ask God to help me to be more and more humble than what I was the day before. Friends, as the people of God, you can't follow Christ and be arrogant. You can't follow Christ and be full of yourself. You can't follow Christ and be prideful. You can't follow Christ and be one who thinks he knows more than God himself. Verse 5. Notice the text, how it unfolds, the mind of the psalmist continues to unfold in the condition of the righteous mentality. A good man deals graciously, favorably, I believe one version would say, and lends. I'm always interested in words. I told the young people on uh, last week at camp that Christians must study to be wordsmiths. Because we deal with words. <laughs> no, no wonder when you think of Jesus, he's the word, John 1 and verse 1. Paul tells Timothy, preach the word. It's the word that sanctifies, John 17, 17. Friends, we got to get in the word, stay in the word. But notice, he says he deals graciously, favorably, and he lends. What does it mean to lend? When you think of the word lend there, here we understand that the, the conduct, the characteristic of a righteous one is one who joins himself to another. That's why we're supposed to lend to the poor. Look at Proverbs 19. In Proverbs 19, I believe it's verse number 18. Notice what the Bible there says. 
Proverbs 19 and verse number 18. In Proverbs 19, actually it's verse number 17. Notice, he who has pity on the poor, now listen to this, lends to the Lord. Have you ever thought about that? That, that when you're helping someone who can't give it back to you, when, when we're helping people who don't have, whether it is with food, clothing, money, it doesn't matter. As a child of God, do you understand that you're lending to the Lord? Hold on, I can actually lend to God? I thought everything belongs to God. He owns a cattle on a thousand hills. He says, you're lending to me. What happens when Christians want to hoard what they have? It sounds like Luke 12. You have the rich man. He says, I'm going to tear down these barns. I'm going to build greater barns. And God said, fool, thy soul will be required of thee this night. Here we understand that when we, when we lend to the poor, or when we have pity on the poor, we actually lend to the Lord. Now put the definition in there. When we have pity on the poor, we join ourselves to the Lord. <laughs> God is so good that he puts us in a position always be joined to him. Who else would we want to be joined to? And notice the latter part of that verse, and he will pay back what he has given. Old folk used to say when I was a kid, you never uh, outgive God. That's what the old folk used to say all the time. Well, it took me in my 40s to realize, yeah, that's true. It seemed like the more you give away, the more he gives back. It makes so much sense. So here's the question. Why are so many not lending? Because they don't think that God is going to give it back to them. Well, who's going to take care of me? Matthew chapter 6, 24 through 34, God's always going to take care of his people. He says, I take care of the lilies of the field. I take care of the fowl of the air. Surely I'll take care of you. Amen. He, takes, he is always taking care of us. It reminds me of Psalm 37 and verse 25. David said, I have been young, but now I'm old. I've never seen the righteous forsaken, nor a seed beg bread. Never. Well, ain't nobody going to take care of me. I got to take care of myself. That's false. God has taken care of us not only spiritually, not only emotionally, but also financially and even psychologically if we'll just trust him. We just got to trust him. And I resolved in my heart to just trust God, even when it looks bleak, even when it doesn't make so much sense, even when I can't understand it all, I'm like, I just got to go with what he says here. And since this is clear, I'm going to stay with this. And when that is not clear, I'll ask for understanding. Friends, a good man deals favorably and he lends. He will guide his affairs with discretion. That's the, the one that conducts himself in righteousness. And, and I believe that that's what we're trying to do. But every now and then, as the people of God, we have to be reminded of these things. And uh, it reminds me of Peter and what he says, as long as I am in this tent, this tabernacle, I will remind you. It won't bother me to remind you the things you already know. Some people, they get all upset because you're telling them things they already know. It's a good thing that God loves us enough to keep telling us over and over and over what we already know. As young people, I've been young too, and y'all been young too. You don't want nobody telling you over and over. You, how, how many times are you going to say that, Mom, Dad? Dad, how many times are you going to say that? I'm going to say it until you get it. One old preacher said, uh, he, he's preaching on repentance. And members come up to him and say, why do you keep preaching on repentance? Because you ain't repented yet. So I got to keep on, keep on preaching repentance till you, till you repent. The <laughs> same thing. And so here, he will guide his affairs with discretion. Turn your Bibles to Ephesians chapter 5. Look at verse 15 for the Christian. When you think of the way we ought to be living, being a person of discretion, one who walks in a way that's careful. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly. The word there in the original is acrobat. 
See that you walk the tightrope. See that you walk carefully. See that you make sure that every step that you take, the steps of a good man are ordered by the Lord. Make sure that everything you do is calculated. So as, the, as a Christian, we shouldn't do anything unless it is calculated, Colossians 3.17. And what that does is it puts us in a position where we can actually order our steps and know where we're going, why we're going, and when we're going. It takes thought and it takes us taking things slowly. And so notice what he says. He says, see then that you walk circumspectly, not as fools, but as wise. Why? Redeeming the time because the days are evil. Go two books over, Colossians chapter 4. In Colossians chapter 4, this was actually Paul's prayer. This was Paul's prayer, starting at verse number 2. Colossians chapter 4, verse number 2. Continue earnestly in prayer, being vigilant in it with thanksgiving. Meanwhile, praying also for us that God would do what? Open to us a door for the word to speak, the mystery of Christ, for which, also I, for which I am also in chains, that I may make it manifest as I ought to speak. Walk in wisdom toward those who are outside, redeeming the time. Let your speech Always be with grace, seasoned with salt. Why, Paul? That you may know how you ought to answer each one. Go back to Psalm 112 and let's put this together. When we consider the good man who deals graciously or favorably and he lends, uh, he will guide his affairs with discretion. He understands that I have to make sure that when I say this, it's the right thing. When I do this, it's the right thing. If I think this, it's the right thing. Well, Brother Bonner, who does that? The one who is discreet. The one who uses good judgment. Sometimes, I've, over the years, I've learned rather, that it's just good to not say much and listen to what people are saying. So you can actually understand what they're saying. But sometimes, even in marriage, I already know what she's going to say. So I'm going to beat her to it. We've become professionals at that. I already know what you're going to say. So I'm going to say it. How do you know? Let me tell you why I say that. When we do that, we don't give people an opportunity to demonstrate that they have grown. They probably are going to say something different. My wife had told me on many occasions, I wasn't going to say that. Right? But we do each other that way. <laughs> so got people hitting their husbands and wife kicking them. <laughs> That's what, I see y'all kicking each other. Stop all that kicking one another. But it's true. And so what we have to do is we have to be discreet. We have to use discretion. And we will guide our affairs in this way. Look at verse 6. These are characteristics of a righteous one. Surely he will never be moved. The King James Version, I, I believe, says that. The New King James Version uses the word shaken. Let's look at two passages real quick. Psalm 55, verse 22. In Psalm 55, verse 22, here we see the psalmist says something. Psalm 55, and verse 22. Here we have David, Psalm 55, verse 22. Cast your burdens on the Lord, and he shall sustain you. He shall never permit the righteous to be what, brethren? Moved, shaken. Friends, did you hear that, brothers and sisters in Christ? Now notice Psalm 125, and look at verse 1, and let's put these together. Let's learn some lessons here, because all of us, can learn, and none of us are above learning. And we want to get to a point where who cares what comes through America, whether it is some type of militia or some type of virus, it doesn't matter. We want to be stable. We want to be established. We want to be firm. We don't want to move. We want to keep our eyes on Jesus, the author and the perfecter of our faith. Psalm 125, verse 1. Those who trust in the Lord 
or like Mount Zion, that's Jerusalem, which cannot be moved but abides forever. <laughs> now, friends, that ought to teach us something. That ought to teach us that we can have a sure foundation. We can be a people who don't move, who are going to keep their eyes on the Lord like what we're supposed to and help those who are with us to keep their eyes on Jesus like they're supposed to. And so, go back to Psalm 112 and look. Notice the benefits to this. He says, the righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. I'm going to show you a passage that was given to me about two or three years ago. And really, it changed my perspective on how I viewed God. Let me tell you what I mean by that. There's one thing when you see that you're doing good. There's another thing when you know God knows you're doing good. <laughs> okay? We, we focus sometimes on the negative. God sees the evil that I do. But hold on. He sees the good that you do too. Look at Malachi 3, the last book of the Old Testament. The last book of the Old Testament, at least in our uh, English Bibles. In Malachi 3 and verse number 16, notice, and keep in mind the idea of being reverent toward God, fearing God. In verse 16, then those who feared the Lord, those who were morally reverent, spoke to one another. They declared to one another. They, they conversed with one another. They, they talked with one another. And the Lord did what, Brother Larry? He listened. He heard. When we're talking Bible, when we're talking about life in Christ, guess who's listening? The Lord is. But notice what he does. He's just not listening. He hears so a book of remembrance was written before him for those who feared the Lord and who meditated on his name, who esteemed, who valued, who, who regarded his name as glorious. And notice what he says in verse 17. He says, they shall be mine, says the Lord of hosts, on the day that I make them my jewels, my peculiar treasure, 1 Peter 2 and verse 9. And I will spare them as a man spares his own son who serves him. Then you shall again discern between the righteous and the wicked, between one who serves God and the one who does not serve him. Friends, I don't know about you, but that encourages me. It encourages me when brethren can talk about the word of God and they're ironing things out and, and they may not see things out of eye, but they're talking and they love one another in the midst of it and they're not calling one another false teachers in the midst of it. Amen. <laughs> and God looks down and he says, those are my children. They glorify them. They want what's right for the kingdom. And so here we see something very powerful in Psalm 112. The righteous will be in everlasting remembrance. God will always remember those who remember him. That's why when we come together on the first day of the week to remember the Lord's death till he returns, till he come, how often should we do it? Every first day of the week. Why? Because we're remembering the Lord. For what purpose? To his death till he comes back. God remembers those who remember him. The conduct, the characteristics of a righteous one is one who remembers God, but God will not forget them. Look at Psalm 112 and verse number 7 as we come to some type of conclusion. He says, he will not be afraid of evil tidings, evil news. Bad news is just that, bad news. It hurts when we hear about a sister falling and breaking their hip. That hurts us. It hurts when we find out when someone's been exposed to, to this virus. That ought to hurt us. But friends, those of us who are focused 
Even though that hurts us, there's something also within us that gives us great joy to give thanks in everything, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you, 1 Thessalonians 5.18. It's amazing that God never wants his people to be so down in the dumps that they don't think about who he is. So, God, what are you doing for us? I'm keeping you balanced. No one is ever like this. We're always like this. All the time. That doesn't mean we're bipolar. I've been called tripolar. <laughs> Evelyn, you remember that? I had a sister call you tripolar. That's fine. That's fine. If that's a medical condition, go ahead and give it to me. Then I'll just be like this. <laughs> but God, what are you doing? I'm keeping you balanced. We see it in the life of Jesus. He was balanced though. He had his ups and he had his downs. So what? That's the way life is. No one is ever like this. It's always varying degrees, varying degrees. And so we see something powerful in this text. He will not be afraid of evil news. God has not given us the spirit of fear, but power, love, and a sound mind. Friends, we don't have to be afraid of anything. And so when we consider these words, we need to be pondering on things that are good and wholesome and upright. Paul would say it like this in Ephesians 4, I'm sorry, Philippians 4, verses 4 through 9. Rejoice in the Lord always, and again I say rejoice. Does it sound like a person who has time to be depressed all the time? And that's a command. And sometimes the older we get, we give ourselves license to be down in the dumps. No, if anything, the older you get, because you're growing in grace, you're an example of righteousness and the character of righteousness that people ought to be able to say, I want to be like you because I see that you're, amen. And sometimes the older we get, the more cynical we become. No, grow in grace. And so we understand that we have to think on things that are good and honest and noble and just and lovely. Good report. And so God wants us to be steadfast. Look at the end of verse 7. His heart is steadfast, trusting in the Lord. You remember what Paul told the church at Corinth? He said, be ye steadfast, immovable always abounding in the work of the Lord, 1 Corinthians 15, 58. As much as you know that the, your labor is not in vain, where? In the Lord. We're not doing this on accident. We're not doing this for nothing. We're not staying steadfast just to be staying steadfast. We have a goal in front of us, and that goal is to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. You've been faithful with a few things. I make a ruler over many. Enter into the joys of thy Lord. Friends, if you can't uh, give yourself a pep talk, I don't know who will give you one. David said on one occasion that he encouraged himself in the Lord. Sometimes that has to happen even with us. He says his heart is, is established. He will not be afraid. Look at uh, 1 Peter 5 and verse 10 for the Christian. Here we see under the Mosaic system in Psalm 112, that one can be established, one can be firm, one can know that they are saved and all right. Under the New Testament, it's the same. God is not the author of confusion. God is the same yesterday, today, and forevermore. God has always wanted his people to be strong in the Lord and the power of his might. And so with conviction, we go to God and say, I can do that. I can be one who knows for a fact that I can be strong, I can be established, and I can do what God will have me to do in the midst of anything that comes my way. And so Peter would say in 1 Peter 5 and verse number 10, notice, but may the God of all grace, who called us to his eternal glory, I love the idea behind that phrase because the idea is God is calling us from glory to his glory. And that's the only way he can call us. God can't call us from earth to earth because God is not on earth. God is in glory, calling us to glory. But notice what he goes on to say. It's powerful. By Christ Jesus, after you had what? This can't be right. That can't be in the Bible. After you have suffered a while? 
2 Timothy 3 and verse number 12, all they that live godly shall suffer persecution. Peter would say, if any man suffer as a Christian, let him not be ashamed, but let him glorify God in this behalf. After you have suffered a while, perfect, establish, strengthen, and settle you. I put four things in my Bible, in my notes there, and I said four different Greek words all to sustain us, to encourage us, to make us strong. And some people, they're using different things to make them strong, which is no strength at all. So God wants us to be strong in the Lord, which requires his word, which requires fellowship, which requires prayer and meditation, which requires humility, which requires us fighting the good fight of faith. It's not just one thing. Requires the blood of Christ. Requires repentance and confession. Requires being rebuked and reproved. Requires being exhorted and encouraged. Friends, God wants us to be established. He wants us to be firm. We told the young people at camp that you gotta develop a strong mind. There's so many weak-minded people today who think they're strong. We gotta be strong. And I told the, the, the boys in my class, I said, it's not, it's not what they call you that should bother you. It's what you answer to. Y'all get that when you get home. <laughs> so many people getting all bent out of shape because he called me this. Is it true? Well, no. Then keep on pressing. If it is true, do something about it. <laughs> Y'all looking funny. I'm amazed that we just answer to anything. We allow anything to get us all bent out of shape. Well, that's not me. When I was a kid, one thing that you didn't say, you didn't say your mama. Those were fighting words back in the day. Man, Joker's taking off the coat, but he's like, come on, come on. <laughs> and then somebody had to say, do they know your mama? No, why you get upset? I don't know. But that's how we are even as adults. Yeah. We get on, you gotta be strong. When Jesus was on the cross, they reviled him, but he did not revile in return. He knew who he was. He knew why he was here. We know who we are, supposedly, and we need to know why we're here. Let's finish up. Notice Psalm 112. Don't worry about this tie, I don't want to wear it anyway. He says, he will not be afraid until he sees his desire upon his enemies. We've got to be strong. We've got to fight the good fight. Paul fought the good fight. Paul didn't worry about his enemies because he knew that his enemies were going to be taken care of by God. Romans 12, verse number 19. Vengeance is mine, saith the Lord. I'll take care of it. I'll repay. He says, he has dispersed abroad. He has given to the poor. There's that same idea that we saw in verse number five. He has given to the poor. His righteousness endures forever. His strength, his horn will be exalted with honor. The wicked will see it and be grieved. It pains the wicked when they see the godly doing godly things. But should that stop us as Christians? Friends, let it not stop us. Let us be the people of God. For the Bible says, the wicked will see it and be grieved. He will gnash his teeth and melt away. The desire of the wicked shall perish. I'll end with Psalm 1. Look at Psalm 1. <clears throat> Look at 4 through 6. In Psalm 1, 4 through 6, After he talks about the godly and how the blessed man is walking and should be walking, he said, but the, the ungodly are not so. This is so encouraging to me. Because sometimes we see the ungodly and they're prospering, Psalm 73. They, they have no pains. They have nothing holding them back. They don't even acknowledge God. Why are they prospering? Who cares? Doesn't even matter. To the spiritual mind, it doesn't matter who's prospering and who's not prospering. What matters is who's spiritual, who's godly, 
Who's walking according to the spirit? Who's walking according to the word of God? That's what matters. He says, but the ungodly are not so, but are like the chaff, which the wind drives away. Therefore, the ungodly shall not stand in the judgment, nor sinners in the congregation of the righteous. For the Lord knows the way of the righteous, but the way of the ungodly shall what? Shall perish. I don't know about you, but that encourages me because I know that if I come down on the side of righteousness, I don't have to worry about perishing. I come down on the side of righteousness, making sure that I honor my wife the way I'm supposed to. Making sure that I have a good relationship with my brethren as much as lies within me. Making sure that I'm being honest in everything that I'm doing before God and man. Making sure that I am a spiritually minded man and when I find things that are not spiritual in my mind, I take every thought captive to the obedience of Christ. Friends, the righteous man has characteristics of righteousness. If I find myself putting on a, on a police suit, a police uniform, and I'm not a policeman, I'm a, an imposter. I don't want to be an imposter. I want to be a Christian, one that is clothed in Christ, clothed with humility, clothed in love, but be a person who understands that God wants me to be direct with him and with those who oppose the righteousness of God. And so hopefully this will encourage us to have those characteristics of righteousness. As I was looking at Psalm 112, I started just kind of going through it and exegeting it and doing the word study and thinking about the context and looking at it, I'm like, wow, that this is good for us. And friends, what better life to live than the life of a Christian? But what better life to die in than the life of a Christian? I leave you with this one point. In order for us to have these characteristics, we have to be what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, 31, I die daily. Michael Light would say this, all of us are dead men. We either dead in Christ or dead in sin. That's a great point. Question, which one are we? Let's stay faithful. Let's do the things that God wants us to do and be pleasing in his sight. So if you need special prayer, let us do that for you. But maybe you're, a child, you're not a child of God and you need, you need to obey the gospel. You want to sit down and study. Let's study with you. Let us study with you. In order to be a child of God, you have to be one who is willing to repent. Turn away from sin. The very reason why Jesus came and sent his disciples to Jerusalem, he came, he told them to go and preach repentance and remission of sins that would begin in his name at Jerusalem, Luke 24, verse 44 through 47. So believe that Jesus is the Christ, the son of the living God. Be willing to repent of sins, confess Jesus Christ to be Lord and be buried in water for the remission of your sins. And God will do something amazing. He'll save you from your past sins. He'll wash you from your past sins. And then he'll set you on the road to eternal life. That's the promise. Do you, do you have that? God can't give you the promise of the Spirit until he saves you from your sin. So what a beautiful God that we have, that he's willing to forget everything you've done in your past and put you on the road to righteousness and salvation if you'll only obey the gospel. As we stand and as we sing, the Savior's invitation.